have you been terminated from a position and you feel very strongly you've been wrongfully terminated, the position that you're in may be with a faith-based organization, but you just feel being wrongfully terminated could not happen to you. Listen to Paul in his story and learn how he handled wrongfully terminated in a faith-based organization. Hi there, and thank you for joining us on the Overcomers Overcoming podcast. We feature those who are in the process of overcoming or have overcome any type of life encounter, life obstacle that at the time seemed to be almost insurmountable. With this podcast, we have three objectives in mind. Our first objective is we want you to know with a confident resolve, you are not alone. We want to work with you. We want you to know there are others who are working with you, who want to help you through whatever you are encountering. And together, we will get through whatever you're experiencing. Our second objective is there are multiple options for any life encounter you are facing. We want to help you develop a resolve that there are various options and solutions to any life dilemma. Our third objective is to help you with critical thinking skills. If you're encountering something that was possibly a decision you made sometime in the past, and if you had the opportunity for a life redo, you would make a different decision. We want to help you with those critical thinking skills that can help you make an informed decision and not encounter what you're going through at the moment. We are the Cooper Culture, a veteran-owned business. We work with business personnel and families to develop and sustain connected relationship cultures within their families and organizations. That type of organization is one where people feel wanted, appreciated, and genuinely a part of that organization. I'm with my wife and business partner, Marty, who has helped me facilitate this podcast. Today, we feature Paul Granger for a second episode where he discusses in more detail his wrongful termination. It's his opinion he was wrongfully terminated from a faith-based organization and how he handled that. He addressed the situation in the way that he thought was correct. He worked with his wife and they went for a period of time without an income. He was able to make things work. It's a great story of how we can handle a very difficult situation because many of us sometimes have our identity in our work, but certainly we need the income. Marty, what are some takeaways we can learn from Paul? Ron, the first podcast we had with Paul and this one, Paul shows his complete trust in Christ and depending on him, knowing Christ promised to take care of you, Paul and his wife believed that and so they made it through their challenges. It's a great opportunity. Learn how Paul and his wife made it through. You may be in a similar situation. Let's listen and learn together. Paul, thank you so much for coming back with us. For our listeners who may be joining you for the first time, you have gone through a fairly significant life event through job transition and some other things. But I thought today, Paul, um, talk to us about your job transition, how it came about, but how did you make that life pivot? And I'm coming from the perspective, some of our listeners have their identity in their job. And boy, if anything were to happen, they're laid off, the company goes bankrupt, any number of things, without that job, they don't know who they are kind of thing. And that may be a little bit of an overstatement, but for some people it's not. Paul, welcome back. Great to have you with us, brother. Yeah, it's great to be back and I'm grateful for the opportunity. And and I think you're right that what we do is so deeply attached to who we are. And it's not our fault because it's culturally just how we're conditioned. I mean, we are taught from a young age, you got to figure out what you're going to be when you grow up. Are you going to be a fireman, a doctor? Like our books as children are designed around that. Then we get into school and we're pushed to figure out what we're going to do, who we're going to be. By the time you get to college, the stakes are even higher. You got to figure out which college based on what it is you think you're going to do the rest of your life. Your major, 
you got to shape all the courses around that. And you better hope your mind doesn't change. Because if you get to the end of those four years and your mind changes, you either have to make a very, very hard and costly call or keep on going in a direction that you're not even sure you want to go in. And then you get into everyday life. And when you meet someone, the first question is, uh, what do you do? And so now when we introduce ourselves, we'll say, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm a, and so it's not unfair that, that people are doing that. But what you and I know is that that is a limited understanding of identity, a limited understanding of reality. And as uh, I'm a Christ follower and as a, a believer, not just in Jesus, but in what, what scripture says, I've come to realize that reality works a lot different than what I've assumed and sometimes what I've been told. And so you have this one reality where you are what you do, that you who you are is defined by your job. Your value is defined by your job. If you're unemployed, that's not good. <laughs> like you need to get it. And so you'll press into this. And like you said, when that is lost, it can be incredibly detrimental. Now, my situation was interesting because in high school, I had this strong sense that my life was supposed to be devoted to ministry. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> I didn't have much of a framework for what that would look like, but it was just clear to me that I wasn't going to have a traditional job. My job was supposed to be serving God in some intentional way. And so I went to college, uh, studied religion and Christian ministries, began working in ministries. And I share that because when I came into my last traditional job, that was a ministry job, um, I did so from a place of wanting to seek God. And in working for a ministry, I was also wanting to love others. And so from a Christian standpoint, I was checking the boxes, love God, love others. Therefore, things should work out well. And because it's a ministry job, it should be a pretty safe and secure job. I mean, it's I'm not in the corporate sector where it could be cutthroat and I could just be fired in a moment for some financial reason or someone else can come up and, you know, for unfair reasons, they'll get the job instead of me like, no, 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 I'm, I'm working for a ministry. So this should be safe, should be secure. As long as I'm to the best of my ability doing my job well and honoring others should have total job security. Well, I ended up serving in this role for over five years. And at the start of it, when I was brought in, uh, I ended up actually taking on really three different jobs. Uh, but as many who have worked in ministry know, sometimes you have to wear multiple hats. That's just the name of the game. I think we use that as an excuse far longer than we should. There is a period in which that could be true. A willingness to take on more and persevere can be a healthy thing. But then when that becomes the expectation too long, <laughs> it can be unhealthy. And so I was told early on, hey, you're going to be doing this, this, and this. Uh, it's not going to be sustainable long term. So at some point, we're going to have to get some other people in. But are you willing for now to do this? And I felt, felt like I was saying, do it, go forward. I said, yes. The year came, an opportunity came to hire someone to take on some of these things. And through a series of events, uh, I realized I needed to release that person in order for someone else to be served well uh, within the organization, for her to shift into a different role because they had lost someone. And I knew that would be costly because I knew it'd be another year before that conversation would even happen. But I felt like God said to do it. So, you know, I'm two years in to this very uh, hefty triple role and still wanting to love God and love others through it. But a, a new boss came in that came from a corporate setting. And so his understanding of how things work, what success looks like, what productivity should look like who is a good worker, who is not a good worker, uh, different than you would normally see in a ministry setting. Uh, didn't have the same level of grace, uh, had a drive that doesn't always match when uh, God calls us to serve and there isn't the normal fruit. Oh, that's fine. Like he had been serving as a board member and a volunteer for the ministry for a long time. So I felt like God was inviting me to, uh, to serve with loyalty. And that loyalty is not a word that I often just use out of the blue. So that's what really stood out to me is that word came in my mind. In other words, I felt like I was saying he's stepping into a hard role 
and I want you to serve him well and honor him in his authority, which made it particularly hard when our first meeting, uh, he ended up pushing back on me and pushing some uh, hefty expectations that were just unreasonable. And I'm like, how do I tell him I, I'm not actually capable of doing this? He's asked me to do this thing in a season that is my hardest season by far in the year. How do I tell him this without looking like I'm just unwilling, without looking like I'm unloyal? And I don't know if that's what set the stage or something else. But from that point on, something had been planted in his mind around who I was, um, that I was not loyal, that I was not a hard worker, that I was not committed, that I was not competent, that all these things that over the course of a few years would recurrently come out in meetings. And so now I'm really wrestling with identity because I, 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 I thought God led me here. I mean, I prayed, I sought God in this. I feel like I'm actually really good at what I'm doing. I feel like I'm serving with integrity and I feel like God is producing fruit through it. So, so why is this happening? Is it, is it me? Is something wrong? Like I actually began to wonder if I was crazy because the way I understood the world, <laughs> the way I understood myself seemed to not be how he understood it. And over time, others that were in connection. And so it was a tremendously painful series of years, especially as more and more people began to question me staying there. Because after some particularly hard meetings, I actually told God, God, this is, this is wrong. This isn't right. This feels horrible. Can I leave? <laughs> I start to job search. Can I find another job? And the invitation God kept giving was I want to invite you to stay and it's going to get harder. And that's an annoying invitation <laughs> to stay in an unjust space and for it to get harder. <laughs> like, normally it's if you seek God, then things get better, right? But it was such a clear invitation that I did something that people began to rebuke me for. I, I stayed in a place that I was treated unfairly. <laughs> uh, I was questioned. My identity was, was muddied. And people began to blame me. This is your fault that you're staying here. This is, this is your fault that you're choosing to be in this. So the years pass. I continue to try to seek God as hard as possible. Things get harder. I begin to question reality. I begin to question my sanity. I, I ask God, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And he very patiently and quietly would invite me to remain. And there came one point that... Uh, just something egregious happened to the point where I felt like I needed to call one of my pastors in and set a meeting between my boss and the pastor, because the thing that happened was just beyond crossing the line. And so I do this and I've got a body of evidence. I mean, I've printed out some papers that, that show that I am actually working hard. I am actually creating system. I am actually producing fruit. I'm doing my job. Well, all these things said about me, like here's the evidence. And the, there were two meetings, and the first meeting was, went so horribly that I just got on my knees and and wept to God, like out loud. God, I've, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, I've done everything, and nothing is working. Like there's, It's clear to me that there's nothing I can do to fix this situation. And it was like God said, well, it's about time you stop trying to fix the situation. Because <laughs> I was trying to fix how I was perceived. I was trying to fix the growingly unsustainable workload. I was trying to fix all these things that God never told me to fix. He just invited me to remain. And so in the second meeting, I still had these papers because I still hadn't fully gotten it. And the, the boss had basically thrown an ultimatum, like either accept the things as they are and stop complaining or go. <laughs> I'm like, this is a ministry. <laughs> like, and I feel like God's not releasing me. How in the world do I answer this? And, and he said something that triggered my humanity. And I'm reaching down for my papers because I can prove them wrong right here, here and now. And my pastor, uh, by the Spirit's prompting, was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't work for this guy. You don't work for God. Uh, you don't work for this guy. You don't work for this ministry. You work for God. So what is your boss, God, telling you to do? And at and that moment, it clicked. <laughs> like I had been trying so hard to function in this human work environment, to, to get in the good graces of this human boss. 
And meanwhile, I had total job security as an ambassador of Christ. I had a boss, God, who actually knew me more authentically than I know myself, loved me deeply despite my brokenness. <laughs> and I thought, and I responded, I feel like he's inviting me to stay. But, but if I do, and, and I start going into the human thinking and my pastor is like, well, no, 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 don't worry about that. God will take care of that. You just need to know what God's inviting you to do and do it. And this, this peace came that I had not experienced in all my efforts to do my job well, to, to try to please my boss, to try to, to seek God. This peace came not just from seeking God, but actually trusting him, saying, I'm willing to endure hardship because God told me to, <laughs> because he invited me to even, not even telling me, but inviting me. And I kid you not, a few days after what was supposed to be a clean slate, uh, my boss comes to me and starts uh, gently reprimanding me <laughs> for something that I'm like, this is absolutely not wrong. And my humanity would have normally defended myself. But God said, you don't need to prove yourself to him. You don't need to justify yourself. Answer his questions, but be confident in who I made you to be and how I've called you to function. And so with an unnatural confidence, I answered his questions. And it got to the point where by the end of it, he, he didn't concede, but he let it go because I think he realized that he had kind of mis, misstepped. And, and for a bit, it seemed like things were actually going to get better. And my humanity started to creep in. Oh, I cracked the code. I, I figured out what God wanted. And now he's going to make my boss see me accurately. He's going to make the job uh, responsibilities actually sustainable or get me people to sustain. Like he's going to do it. It's going to happen. And then six months pass and things begin to happen that really begin to confuse me because it seemed like things weren't just getting hard again, but they were getting worse. And a series of events happened that were just deeply dishonoring. Uh, a new person came to the table that operated with an extreme level of lacking integrity, whether he realized it or not. Um, things were told to me that were ended up being lies uh, things were said about me that were not true and were a manipulation of information. And I'm like, God, what in the world? <laughs> like, I, I thought I was seeking you. <laughs> like, I've, I've, I've stayed and stayed and stayed. So why is it getting even worse now? God, can I please leave? <laughs> like, do you want me to stay or go? Just tell me. And he didn't answer me. There was this silence. And one thing I learned a long time ago is that silence can be an answer, that God hears our prayers and he responds to them, but sometimes he responds in silence because that's what we need to hear. We want an answer and God's like, no, you don't need an answer right now. <laughs> you need to just sit in this moment or you need to seek me without a solution being poised to you. And so I began to wonder if the answer he was giving was wait. Not yes, not no, not stay, not go, but wait. And things begin to happen that's, that seem to be indicators that God was doing something. Not big enough that it's like, oh, God's at work. Everything's going to be fine. But I think God is up to something. And there's this one specific week, the first week of August of 2018, where more of these things begin to happen. And I get to a point where I'm like, I think, I think I'm about to lose my job. <laughs> In fact, there was a one specific day, I think it was August 2nd, <laughs> um, my boss came in and he's like, hey, uh, can we do a meeting at four and we'll do it offsite at this coffee shop? And <laughs> it's one of those things I was like, I think, I think he's getting the offsite for a reason. And I go home uh, to grab some lunch and I tell my wife, hey, I think I'm going to get fired this afternoon. And she's like, there is no way. Like, you're, you're not a bad employee. You're not doing your job wrong. You're actually succeeding at what you're doing and even if you were doing things wrong like there's a process like there's a there's a 30 day like here's your issues get them right kind of thing like there's no way and i'm like no i think i'm about to get fired <laughs> and a beautiful thing happened i had a friend that god had connected me with just weeks earlier uh through just spirit-led prayer and i and she didn't know any of this stuff and i felt like i wasn't 
prompting me to tell her, but I felt like he wanted me to tell her to pray for this meeting. And she said, you need to invite the Holy Spirit at the beginning of that meeting. Now, I was still getting to know the Holy Spirit and what that meant. Uh, and so I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're going to pray before. And she's like, no, 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 no. You need to invite the Spirit. Not them. Like, you need to intentionally do that. And so I go, I get to the door, and my humanity once more tries to squeeze in. Oh, but why would they fire? What are they going to say? And how are you going to respond to that? And God's like, no, 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 no. Do not defend yourself. Do not protect your job represent me well it was very clear so clear that i just felt this wave of peace i opened the door there are the two guys sitting at the table and i know i know what it's going to be i sit down they don't mince words and the boss was like you know paul i uh i, I don't there's no easy way to say this but and i was like hold a second can i pray before we start <laughs> like some i would not have like had that level of boldness in that type of meeting but my friend had made it clear and god affirmed it i was supposed to invite the holy spirit so i prayed and invited the holy spirit and i was like okay go ahead and he proceeded to fire me um no reason given just uh you know we don't feel like you're a good fit now i've been working there for five and a half years um so that on on a human level should have been insulting um to not be given a reason reason should have been crushing but i felt this peace I felt this peace that it was okay that I was unjustly being fired. Uh, in fact, the spirit was moving in such a crazy way that I ended up affirming and praying for both the men that were firing me, not because of me, my, my humanity. That's not what I would have chosen, but the spirit moved through my mouth to speak words of encouragement to two men that were doing something uh, very hurtful. And I went home and I, told my wife with a smile, <laughs> I just lost my job. She did not smile uh, because it absolutely was an unexpected and ridiculous thing. M there is very few people that I know that weren't shocked by the news. Many were angered by it. And the spirit prompted me to calm them down, to, to tell them to not fight for me. <laughs> uh, there's a number of folks that actually were going to leave their jobs because they were like, we're not going to stand for that. No, 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 no. Uh, I had got, the way that it was set up. I was given the opportunity to continue for another month. That was my last month there. And to have an opportunity, they gave me the freedom to share the news with others, <laughs> which like, this is very interesting. And the spirit prompted me to do so in a way that was not dishonoring. That was not throwing in any, anyone under the bus, but actually was taking advantage of the opportunity to speak the spirit into these people that were going to continue in this space. And so there's something else happening at the same time as this is happening. Two things. One, my wife is working for the same ministry. So there's a whole other dynamic there. We were all initially uh, on the leadership team until I was pushed out in the months pre prior and so she was in the meetings where things were said about me that weren't true. <laughs> she continued to work there when her husband was unjustly fired. So there was a hard dynamic there. She was also pregnant with our third child. So I was fired when my wife was in her first trimester, <laughs> which is not a great time for someone to lose half their income. But God invited me to not operate out of financial fear. Everyone else was saying... Uh, you need to get a job as soon as possible and you need to get a good good paying job. Maybe do you want to stay in ministry? Maybe you should get a better job because your wife's going to be on maternity leave and all these things. And God was like, no, don't operate out of financial fear. I want you to trust me. In fact, he took it even a step further. My boss gave me permission to do some job searching during my last month. I felt like I was saying, no. In fact, I don't want you to job search that month or the next month. I want you to take the next month as a mini sabbatical absolutely foolish thing to do as a father of two with one on the way, as a homeowner, as someone with expenses. But it was just so clear what God was inviting me to. And the other piece to this is to become unemployed at, you know, I was in my upper 30s at the time, uh, is a rough thing. Particularly when I've been working in ministry all my life, uh, I have not been poised to step into some high earning roles now because I've been doing ministry work and maybe I'll be able to squeeze or pivot a certain thing, but it's, 
the market is would have been very hard to enter for someone like me. Could have been a very stressful thing. So I think in a way, God wanted to protect me from that normal human stress. But the bigger piece that he was doing was really trying to hone in what he had told me a year before that I don't work for some entity that I don't work for some person. I work for him. So I may be functionally unemployed, but I'm not, I might not be making a paycheck, but he's my provider. And so for six months, I was operating in this space of unemployment and no traditional paycheck, a very foolish thing. A baby was born in that time. Christmas fell in that time. Our cat had to get dental surgery. I landed in the hospital for a week. Like things that from a human level scream out, you need an income. And in my humanity, the brokenness of the hurtful things that were said, my humanity was saying, you need a respectful job, respectable job. So people look, don't look at you, look down at you anymore. <laughs> like these things are being cried out. And God's just gently saying, just trust me. Don't operate out of financial fear. Don't operate out of fear of man. And at the end of the six months, I ended up having several job opportunities ahead of me. Some that would pay well, uh, some that would be respectable. And then there's this one with Youth with a Mission, uh, a global entity, a uh, mission sending entity where not a single staff gets a paycheck. None of them. They're all volunteer ministry workers. <laughs> And that's where I felt like would be a step towards God, not towards a step towards financial security, not a step towards reputation, a step towards God. And I'm like, that's where I want to step. It is very risky. This could blow up in my face from a human level, except I just, I feel like God is in this direction. And so it didn't feel like a casual stroll towards him. It felt like stepping off a cliff believing that God would catch me, not seeing his hands there, but believing that they were there. And that was over five years ago uh, that I took that step off a cliff. I have not had a traditional paycheck since then. Uh, my wife felt God inviting her to leave her job and it ended up being for two years, I think. <laughs> so we had no traditional income. Um, and we have never been in a place where loss was was right about to hit us. Like God provided. There are moments where we could have financial fear, but God was right there. And even more than that, my role as ambassador of Christ, like I have been able to serve him more fully as who he's created me to be than I ever had been able to in other ministries. Other ministries, you could, I could fit it in to places, but then I had my functional job responsibilities <laughs> or uh, I would serving well, but someone else had other expectations that changed how I was able to serve. But here I am in this full-time volunteer ministry role. And I know for a fact, I'm doing what God's inviting me to do. I'm serving as he's inviting me to serve. Sometimes I see the fruit of it. Sometimes I don't, but I know that that might be fruit that he sees <laughs> and in eternity, I can see it. And I have such a high level of confidence that as I look forward in this upcoming season of, I don't know what's ahead, I still would rather that unknown and that lack of a paycheck than the traditional job security, than the traditional paycheck, than a clear set of job responsibilities, because I have experienced not just God at work and not just God working through me, but a right understanding of my identity, that I am not this role or that role. I am an ambassador of Christ, a child of God, an image bearer, and that that reality exists whether I'm employed or not, whether things are clear or not, whether I'm doing productive things or not, that role is always present and I have the invitation to live into it in formal and informal ways. Oh, I'm interpreting several things, and I want to uh, see if I've interpreted this correctly. You were raised in a family where maybe serving in a ministry was somewhat of a family expectation, maybe not verbalized, but just kind of uh, implicitly at least expected. The other thing is it is possible that even in a ministry, there can be a toxic environment. And 
I want to I, I want to ask you to address a little bit more about being an ambassador for Christ with somewhat of that as a background if your family raised you that well Paul we uh, we kind of have the at least the implicit expectation you're going to serve in the ministry and your family background may have been such that all ministry is a great place to work everybody is uh surrendered to Christ, and this is the perfect quintessential environment. But in fact, you encountered a culture where there was uh, at least uh, a level of toxicity. That's how I'm processing what you're saying. And you had to have the courage. And there was a part of the mental transformation, well, the courage to confront, but yet also uh, the Holy Spirit saying, Paul, don't try to figure this out on your own. I'm going to use my own terms. God said something to the effect, Paul, I got your back. Don't worry about it. I got you. And so is that a part of being an ambassador for Christ? Uh, that's a that's a very overarching statement of how I process at least a part of what you said. But I'd be interested in you addressing any part of that. Yeah. Well, I'll start with the family piece because it's interesting. Uh so there wasn't necessarily an expectation, but an openness or acceptance or peace or, or in ways an excitement. Like my mom uh, has been a huge role in shaping my faith from, from the very start. And so there was never any point in which it was like, uh, I mean, maybe you could do ministry for a little bit, but you need to get a real job. That was never conveyed to me. Uh, my, my wife's parents, uh, they they saw the value in uh, serving roles. So she is a teacher and they knew that teaching would not be a high paying thing is a hard thing, but they saw the value in her uh, serving others through what she did. And so in the same way, they saw the value in how my role in ministry would be serving others. And so what was interesting is when uh, I decided to go into full-time volunteer ministry, uh, people kind of like, that's that's Paul. That's that's what he's going to do. There wasn't a huge fight against it. When my wife felt led to leave her job, that's when we started to hear more comments around, are you sure? And you can't, you have to have an income. And and so when we stepped into a really crazy step of faith, uh, that's when we started to see uh, it, the idea of a life of ministry, of being an ambassador of Christ, go from aspirational to, is this really a good idea? Now, the beautiful thing is God met uh, each of those uh, spaces of resistance in like unique and specific ways and revealed himself. And that's a whole different story. But it's it pushes on this idea that you expect this level of safety and understanding when it's a body of believers. Right? We, we all read the same Bible and we're talking about the same God and we're talking about, how, yeah, he can provide and yeah, he invites, oh, I mean, he, all the disciples left their jobs and did crazy things. And like, well, we love the stories, but then when it becomes real, ah, this is, this is hard. And we have this notion that these truths will play out in a ministry space, that ministry can't be toxic because we all know that we're called to love and we're all called to see each other as image bearers. So it's impossible, impossible for it to be toxic. And that's sadly not true ministries, churches can become toxic. Um, in fact, often have some level of toxicity because it has some level of humanity. It has some level of wanting to serve God, but the human thinking just takes a little uh, more precedence in this moment or a lot of precedence in this moment. And when I came into that ministry, it was conveyed as we're a family. I, I mean, we're, we're serving God together and we are here for each other. We're a family. When I came in, I think is when a transition started to happen, where it stopped being an easy thing to pursue and took more intentionality, more sacrifice to live out those values. And so I think I was in the first generation of people that it was still communicated in that way, but wasn't functionally lived out in that way. And more things began to drive outside of love, like the uh, financial sustainability of the organization or productivity, or there is a high value of, of hard work, except 
what was valued was actually the unhealthy levels, the people who were overworking and anyone that didn't match that, right? So like all these things are there. And so someone trying to live as an ambassador of Christ in that space, it can be difficult, right? Because it's the people you're supposed to be able to trust, to lean on, who are supposed to hold up your arms and they're not, <laughs> or they're questioning you or they're saying you're wrong. And am I wrong? Am I crazy? But here's the interesting thing. And as you were talking, I was reminded of one unique element of what it means to be an ambassador of Christ in a toxic environment. Uh, if toxic environments are going to exist on this broken world <laughs> with broken people, what we want to happen as individuals is for the toxicity to go away or for it to not affect us. And we definitely don't want to stay in a toxic environment because what good is that if we're only getting hurt? And I had this one point that I believe was after I lost my job and I was healing still, and I'm still healing, but I was healing and I was angry. I was angry. Like, man, like I endured so much unjust hardship. And for what? Because the things that I built fell apart because they could never hire someone to fill one person to fill those three roles. The things that I'd created were dismissed. The people that I was serving, several of them were her like, what good did this do, God? And as I'm wrestling with this one day at church, the pastor starts talking about this idea of the enemy. Uh, it's like the enemy has these arrows and these arrows have names on them. And he's just launching, launching these arrows. And he was talking about how sometimes we are getting hit with arrow after arrow after arrow after arrow. And we're trying to be where God wants us to be. And we're trying to serve him and we're trying to seek him. And we keep getting hit with arrows. But then we look at them and it doesn't have our name on it. In fact, it has a whole bunch of names that aren't ours. And what he was basically saying is sometimes God invites us into spaces not to protect us from arrows, but because he has equipped us to be able to take the arrows that were intended for others. And I realized there were so many young adults that I was serving that God had called me very specifically to support, to guide, and to love in, in clear and sacrificial ways that I felt like God was saying, I wanted you there to take arrows for them. And it was interesting. Whereas right before that, I was mad about the arrows and the pain they caused. When I realized I had been given the privilege to take the arrows for others, I didn't care about the pain as much anymore. <laughs> it still hurt, but I was, I was willing and I was grateful. So what does it mean to be an ambassador of Christ? Sometimes it's not just speaking for God. That's how we usually think of it. Uh, and then we envision the ambassador goes back to their comfortable hotel or goes and sees the sites. Like they're living a nice life because they get, no, like sometimes as an ambassador, we had to be present in the, the hard situations and spaces in order to be used by God to protect or guide others. Um, you know, you think of the prophets when they were called to be ambassadors of God. So many of them were beaten, stoned, insulted, or even killed, not because of anything they did, but because they represented God and their voice ended up saving others. They, they took the hits because their life was no longer about protecting themselves and their own advancement. Their life was now about representing the God who created them. And if they lost their life, as the apostle Paul puts it, it didn't matter because it was rubbish. It was rubbish compared to knowing Christ, to serving God. And so, so it's interesting then. Uh, it doesn't mean that we accept toxic ministry environments. I think churches, ministries need to be we need to do more humble introspection more often around, are we actually living into love God, love others? Are there ways in which we're loving ourselves? Are there ways in which we are protecting and pursuing things other than uh, God? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Is that what drives our spending, our programming, or is it something else? I mean, we got to do those things because at any point that seek first isn't what we are doing, toxicity is going to come in. Like it's going to come in. It may be small, it may be big, it may be gradual, it may be quick. Um, so we, we need to be aware of this, but I don't think we can eliminate it. And so 
in that reality, I think we then have to ask, is God inviting me to be in this space? And do I trust him within that? Um, sometimes let me advance that will- that. Yeah, let me advance that just a little bit. Yeah. Paul. Was there a even a maybe a fleeting moment where you thought when you thought I can litigate this and I feel pretty certain I can win this. <laughs> but then maybe God spoke to you and uh-huh. said, that's not my that's all, that's not what I want you to do to be an yeah. ambassador. My ambassador, Paul, maybe. Uh, and I certainly don't want to try to portray myself as the Holy Spirit, but I'm asking you, <clears throat> was there a point at which you felt the Holy Spirit saying, nope, Paul, um, I will empower you. I will give you the strength to endure. Yep. Absorb the arrows for, uh, don't play the martyr complex, but rather, okay, I'm going to give you the strength to do what needs to be done because there's a greater purpose, a greater output that's going to come from all this. And I'm just reading into this a little bit, Paul, and I don't want to take it off in the wrong direction. No, that's it's the right direction. It's very insightful. Uh, two things come to my mind. One is there's plenty of moments during my time uh, in the ministry where I was fighting for my reputation, fighting for my job. I'm not even a fighter. Like I'm, I am a peacemaker. <laughs> Like, I don't push my will. Uh, so it, it would have to take a lot to put me in a position where I was fighting for myself and it seemed to be futile. And I remember the the summer before that really egregious moment, I was actually the week before those meetings. I was like, God, I, what, uh, this is, this is awful. What am I supposed to do? And I was ruminating and I was actually supposed to go on vacation. The The moment happened the day before my vacation and my vacation felt like it was going to be ruined because my mind was just ruminating on what he did, what happened, how am I supposed to address this? And throughout the summer, this had been happening and it happened again uh, in this moment, a song would conveniently play. It's a song by urban doxology called fight for me. And the whole premise is my God fights for me. And in the moments where I was ready to fight for myself, It was like God was saying, no, I will fight for you. I will fight for you. And so that week, it was a hard week. But every time my mind would ruminate, I would just say, fight for me, fight for me, fight for me. It didn't fix everything. Things didn't go away. The ruminating would start again. But in that moment, there was this peace. I had to constantly come back to the place of remembering that God wants to fight for me, that I don't need to fight for myself. I shouldn't fight for myself because I may be fighting the wrong war. The second time uh, that came up in my mind was two months after I lost my job. Now, again, I felt like God had been working. The spirit moved. I'm smiling. Like I'm, I know God's working. The the spirit speaking through me into other people. Like I should be good. Right. So why two months later does anger just suddenly envelop me? Do I feel this depth of, what they did was wrong. Like, I'm like, I thought I had forgiven them. Did I not? What's going on? And I'm wrestling and I'm wrestling and I'm wrestling. And I go to a couple, the the elders and I'm like, I don't know what to do here. What happened like is objectively wrong. I'm not sure how to navigate this, but right now I am feeling this depth of pain and anger and I don't know what to do. Can you give me some spiritual guidance? It was interesting. I ended up having conversations with two elders and one of them gave a very like logical response. Like, yep, what happened to you was wrong. Uh, And so what I would recommend is because I'd written everything up, you take this and you, you, we could go to the, the board of the ministry and we can push all this. And that would have been a great way to, to restore my name, you know, to, to bring some kind of, restoration to all that had been broken, but I didn't feel a peace about it. And I talked to the other elder and in that conversation, uh, and it wasn't what she told me, like it was, what was beautiful is we were seeking God together. Um, the, it was my wife and I, and she and her husband and just seeking God. And the sense that I got was the complete opposite of what a person should do in that situation. I felt like God was inviting me to 
go directly to those two men and to basically say, uh, I just need a minute of your time. You don't have to respond at all with anything other than thank you for sharing and then forgive them and release them from owing me anything, even an apology. To this day, my humanity still wants apologies from them. <laughs> so that was not an easy thing. But it was also at the same time very easy <laughs> because I felt such a peace that that's what the spirit was inviting me to, to not fight for myself, to not litigate, to not any of those things, but to give up the very thing that I wanted, the restoration, the apology, the acknowledgement. <laughs> And it's because the purpose of that wasn't my reputation or my functional job. Jesus was misrepresented by pretty much everyone, <laughs> sometimes in slight ways, sometimes in enormous ways. He didn't fight for his reputation when he was on trial and there were false witnesses. You know, scripture talks about him not opening his mouth as a lamb led to the slaughter. Like, it's because there are things that matter more than reputation. There are things that matter more than employment. And the thing that God wanted to do in me forgiving and releasing might not have even have been for me. He might have planted a seed in them that I may never get to see the fruit of, but he wanted to work through me to take maybe arrows that were intended for them. And in my humanity, it could be easy to say, well, they should get a couple arrows in their back for what they did. It's like, but God's like, no, you want to take and, uh, arrows even for them. Jesus says, love your enemies. I mean, they weren't even my enemies. They had things going on in their life that led to some just misguided judgments and decisions and perceptions. Like they weren't the enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So if I'm supposed to love my enemies, then surely I can love those who mistreat me. <laughs> right? And so, yeah, I, I think we had these moments in life, you know, and I'm not saying this prescriptive, you should never fight for yourself. That's, that's not even what I'm saying, but I think more often than not, that's our default. What I am saying is, are we seeking God? And if God says, I'll fight for you, are we willing for him to fight the battle? Even if it means we don't know how he's going to fight it. We don't agree with it. Or if he says, yeah, there's not going to be a battle here. You're going to take some more hits. Like, are we willing to trust him in that? And it's hard because it, it's costly on a human level. But the reality is, is whatever we lose here uh, is, it does not compare to what we gain in eternity. You're right. And what I'm interpreting, Paul, is that, uh, again, I'm not going to try to play God and what he was intended for you. But uh, he was saying that, uh, Paul, uh, uh, the greater outcome, the greater good of this might be what we're doing right now, this podcast. You will have other people who are listening to your life experience, your evaluated uh, experiences in how you overcame and you are, you speak with a total resolve. God empowered me to do what was needed to be done, but he did not call me to litigate and fight. He said, I'll do this for you. And I'm the kind of, a per I'm the personality that I don't feel that I'm, uh, my calling is to lay down, let people walk on top of me. No, not at all. <laughs> but uh, God, you tell me what to do and I will do it. And I think that's, that is a matter of being an ambassador in total surrender. And Paul, gosh, I want to thank you for your <laughs> to a degree, I want to thank you for your life experience because you're not a lesser person from it, through it, but rather you've gained the experience and you've got the resolve that, nope, you're going to pass forward how God worked through your life. Mm -hmm. And anyone else who's experiencing something like this, you can very rationally say, been there, done that. I'll tell you exactly how God worked me through this. Paul, on behalf of our listeners, I want to thank you for yeah. passing forward, overcoming, and being the voice of authority and resolve you are. Nothing of that is in an arrogant way, but you can speak the confidence of Jesus Christ as his ambassador, telling with resolve exactly how he has worked through you. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity because what I thank you for what you two are doing, because when we don't tell these stories, 
people may find themselves having to believe the lies that are told or having to believe the stories they tell in their heads. And if they don't know that it's possible for God to be God and good, even in a toxic space, like then they're going to fear the toxic spaces. They're going to flee from them or they're going to fight against them. But when we hear these stories of people who have overcome in spaces that they really shouldn't have been able to, then people can look in their own lives and say, maybe God is God and good in my life right now, even though he feels far away, even though it feels like he's forgotten me. Maybe he hasn't. Maybe the story is not done. So thank you for creating spaces for stories. That's all good. Paul, thank you for your life. Thank you for how uh, God is working through you. And through your example, others will benefit. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate having the opportunity to share our and our guests' life experiences with you. The Cooper Culture advances organizations to achieve and sustain high retention rates, connected communication, and trust through personality insights and principled leadership. You can contact us at our website, thecooperculture.com, and you can contact us directly at ron at thecooperculture.com or marty, M-A-R-T-Y, at thecooperculture.com. We work with you to help assess aspects of your culture to advance the environment and people to their best performance. We do that through our staff of certified personal performance coaches, leadership trainers, keynote speakers, and disc personality behavior experts. You can book a speaking engagement directly through our website by contacting us at ron at thecooperculture.com. We look forward to sharing our life experiences with you, some of which are profound, some of which are pretty funny. Some of those life experiences are ones we'll never do that again because we've been through stuff. We truly look forward to working with you, speaking with you, helping advance you in any way that we can.